They've obviously lost Gary in recent years, Jonathan Demi. I mean, these are formative filmmakers. It's hard because um, they're they're my beginning, and I don't get to talk to them in that way. You know, there's so many questions that I have for them now, and um, I love them so much. Prepare your ears, humans. Happy, Sad, Confused begins now. I'm Josh Horowitz. Today on Happy, Sad, Confused, Anne Hathaway is back on the podcast after far, far too long. She's been a princess, a cat woman, and she should really earn another Oscar just for her sultry smoking in her latest Eileen. It's the one and only Anne, Annie Hathaway. Welcome back to Happy, Sad, Confused. Good to see you. Thank you. Thank you for all those kind words. It's so wonderful to see you. Uh, it's been a while. Um, we are talking as we tape this today. We are we're just coming back into humanity after cocooning with families. I assume over the yes. long holiday weekend. How mm -hmm. was your Thanksgiving? What's your? I want to know Anne Hathaway's approach to Thanksgiving. Is it sides? What's your pie technique? What What are you going for? Pie technique. Uh, I don't. I don't. I haven't gotten to pie yet. My pie technique is to order it. <laughs> well, I, me I meant eating. Don't get me wrong. I wasn't. I didn't mean. <laughs> Oh, you're talking about the eating technique. Yeah, yeah. Which pie um, do you go for? Uh, so what I do is I do um I do a bowl approach, and um I do apple pie, pumpkin pie, uh vanilla ice cream in between, and uh, then I do whipped cream on top of that. And then this and that particular day, I had put cinnamon buns out for people, and there was one cinnamon bun left over, so I kind of like cut the cinnamon bun in half and then sprinkle cinnamon bun on top of it. How many people died at your Thanksgiving? How many people had heart attacks? Well, that was my bowl. Everyone else could do it their way. Right, right. But um, but, but I, I I think it's important to know when to say yes to things. And Thanksgiving is a day to say big yes. Big yes. Yeah, I always say my- That's what I, I define my... as a big yes. Just as we're getting to know each other a little bit better. That for me, I would classify as a big yes. 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 I always say my, my, I think my deathbed meal will be a uh, Cinnabon, one of those disgusting giant Cinnabons from the mall. I mean, they're, they're, Interesting. yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, I... It may... yeah. What's yours? Oh, well, I was going to say, I, I'm, 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 I'm kind of, I think I'm a little boring. I just always go with like a perfectly cooked bowl of, uh, pomodoro, basil pomodoro. I mean, yeah. Just, is... you know, like, like it's, oh, it's just delicious. It's, it's the spot. Delicious. I yeah. recently got to have a meal made by an absolute, I don't use this word very often, but he he's a genius. And he managed to make a bowl of mushrooms taste exactly like a bowl of pasta. A magician, a sorcerer. Oh, yes, yes, he is actually. And so, um, so anyway, so, so as I was saying the Pomodoro, I was like, I would also take one of those. <laughs> I would also take a bowl of those <laughs> mushrooms. But if I were to say on your podcast, if I were to lead with a bowl of mushrooms, people would be like, oh God. <laughs> <laughs> I can't. I, I can't get get with you there because mushrooms are one of my Achilles heel. It's mushrooms and beets. They're not on the table for Josh Horowitz, but I respect it. My no, wife no, loves no. a good mushroom. It's okay. Okay, I get it. Everybody's got their thing. Eggplant for me. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. This is this is not a food podcast, despite what people may think. This is <laughs> just a warm up. Act. Turn it into one. <laughs> I mean, I've, tried, I've managed to make most things into food conversations. It's one of my favorite things to talk about. But but we are here to talk about whatever you want to talk about. Well, we're here to talk about a bunch of things. Um, it's funny, the last time you were on the podcast was for kind of a similarly um, hard to define in a great way project. You were on for Colossal way back when. And I remember we I listened back to our conversation and a lot of the, the conversation there, I feel like could apply to Eileen in a great way. Um, these are, you know, they're not like the the the, the obvious like Iowan blockbuster to put the the um the movie in. And I kind of love that about Eileen. Um what I mean, I don't know. How did you I I I saw in an interview somewhere you said uh it's Carol meets Reservoir Dogs, which I think yeah. is like a delicious, beautiful shorthand. But to you, I don't know if you had to classify it, what is this movie like genre-wise? Or does that even matter? Um, well, what we kept saying on set was it's a Christmas love story. <laughs> sure. <laughs> for a certain so, kind of person, yeah. I sort of feel like the way Die Hard is a Christmas movie, the way Gremlins is a Christmas movie, this is a bit of an alternative Christmas movie. Very yeah. alternative, actually. Yeah. And um, yeah, I I have a lot of faith and optimism in audiences. 
And I think that we're, you know, I think it's really important. I love, I mean, I, I love all types of movies and like, give me like a down the middle feel good uh, romp and sure. made, by, made, made by somebody great. And right. I will be, you know, first, first one to go to see it. I will, I love a Nancy Myers movie. Um, yeah. so, so much the same way I love Martin Scorsese movie to say, you know, not that Martin Scorsese, you know, not finding either of those filmmakers is down the middle, but it's, it's a little clearer what it is, uh, that you're, that you're going to be getting. I happen to be a big fan of mixed tone films. I like movies. I mean, and, and I think it's one of the reasons why I'm very excited to be on your podcast. I mean, happy, sad, confused. It's all of it. It's right there. <laughs> you know, I think that I, 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 all, I, my, the way I experience emotion is uh multiple at the same time it's very rarely just one thing so i enjoy that as uh as a film goer and i i like movies that uh were not that require audience participation what about like in terms of when you're in production on a film do you ever have that realization where you're making a different movie than your co-stars and your director where like oh wait i thought this was a comedy i thought this was a black comedy i thought this was a thriller and they don't. And does that matter in the end to the finished product? Uh, so the experience you just described is a nightmare. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I have on occasion shown up on set and realized that the film that I thought that we were talking about, some they were on a completely different page. And at that point, you just sort of have to, I mean, you. I think especially in cinema, you have to yield to the director. It's the director's vision. You're there to support the director's vision. And hopefully you kind of, um, gotten on board in the pre-production stage or in the stage where you're deciding if you're going to do this dance together. Right. Um, so that ha so I have to say the deeper into my career I get, that happens less and less because um, I, I, I kind of just, I don't know, I think I'm more adept at having conversations about what it is and expressing what I think it is and hearing what the other person wants to make and right. uncover what it is that we're going to, there's always surprises and there, there is, and, and that's, it's always a great surprise to learn that you're in something funnier than you realized. Right. Like when I, when I saw, um, I was hoping Eileen was going to have body humor in it because the, the book has goes into such gory detail about what it is to have a body <laughs> that you're uncomfortable in. Right. And, um, and so I, I felt like wh that's a really difficult thing to translate onto the screen. And I think that Otessa and Luke and Will, did a fantastic job with that. And of course, Thomason, who was the person lying in a pool of her own sick. Sorry, spoiler alert. <laughs> We're not going to spoil the whole thing, but we are going to give them a little bit of a tease. So this takes place, I believe it's 64 New England. You mentioned the great uh, Thomason McKenzie, who's one of like our, our great kind of next generation of talents who's just killed oh, it yeah. last night in Soho. Uh, Jojo Rabbit, always amazing. Um, she's copped to being a, a secret or not so secret fangirl of Ann Annie Hathaway. <laughs> Sweet. <laughs> did she did she reveal on set or does, has this come out in the press tour how big a fan she was Sundance when she said it for the first time I'm like oh my gosh like I just it was, I was so I was so flattered you never take anything for I mean I'm still at a stage where I like I don't I don't even know people know who I am so um like usually they do but I never like to take it for granted right and um and so to learn that actually I was in a film that had meant so much to her that was it was incredibly incredibly touching because she really did make it because i because i i had such a i don't know we've got such a loving supportive fun thing together you know it is so the the, the friction or or chemistry between you two is very interesting and it's really palpable in this film the contrast uh, between your two characters, um, you know, she is Eileen. It, it kind of she she's working in this kind of juvenile detention center, prison uh, in the early '60s. You are kind of a mysterious woman. She's got the cigarettes. She's got the blonde hair. There's a lot of questions. Yes, she's <laughs> a lot of smoke and a lot of mirrors. You play a great woman of mystery. This is this is this is in your wheelhouse. Um, did, did is is the blonde hair or the cigarettes more helpful in? nailing down that character. I would think those kind of small but important elements are are key. Yeah. They serve each other. <laughs> they go um, together. <laughs> I, I had a wonderful uh, coffee with Will before we started. And we kind of like, we were both sitting there, we were both excited. And I said, I've had an idea about the hair. And he goes, really, I've had an idea about the hair. And I was like, okay, we can do this one of two ways. You can go first, I can go first. We can just say it at the same time. <laughs> and he said, oh, same time. And we went one, two, three, blonde. 
And what a relief. I know. <laughs> Bald. And, what? No. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, so I can do just not the film I thought we were making, but I can do that. Yeah. Um, to our uh, earlier point. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and um, and he said, I'd love to channel Monica Vitti. And I just went, oh, yes, please. Thank you. And honored and all of those things. So I watched every Monica Vitti I, I could find in the Criterion Collection. And um, I was really, really proud because I won't say what the shot is, but there's a shot at the end of the movie where it was like she touched down and we chat and we channeled her and channeled her and the light is so I can't describe it, but Ari Wagner was our cinematographer and her lighting in this is like she managed to somehow in this really, really freezing landscape, make it look like certain scenes in the background were just like actually catching fire like we're engulfed in flames but right. in this really super subtle way it's amazing how often when you're reading a script or doing a film is it not maybe about one particular scene you want to play but there is one that jumps out because again without ru ru ruining anything there is a key twist a moment towards the, the the last act of the film that really illuminates a lot about your character um that must be delicious to look forward to in a shoot yeah. well i'm going to use a nerd word uh, dramaturgically, it's very important to understand the way you would understand uh, the crescendos and decrescendos of a musical performance or a musical score. It's very important to understand the rise and fall of your character right. as it works in the film. And as I have learned, it's very important to make sure the director understands that from your perspective, too. And, um, you know, I'm really like, so I, uh, I mean, you know, I think it's pretty obvious at this point. I just really love being an actor and it's great if you get a star in a movie, but it's also great if you're in an ensemble. And I'm just like, each experience is its own little gift. Yeah. Um, and sometimes, no, I won't say that. I was gonna I was gonna make a bad joke and say, sometimes you wanna give the gift back, but no, but you're always lucky. You're always, always, always lucky to be there because even the ones that don't turn out the way you thought it was going to, you learn something from it and you develop as, as an actor, as an artist, and as a, a, a human. And um, and so they all wind up being incredibly valuable. So actually, I keep them. So uh, when you are not number one on the call sheet, when you're not the title character, it usually means that you have a more limited amount of screen time to work with. And so it's actually very important that you understand your terrain. Right. Because uh, you have to be able to maximize uh, your ability to communicate what you want to to the audience so making in this case bold choices like having blonde hair the way she walked the way she sounded you know uh, the way she smoked a cigarette my hope was you thought you had her pegged from the first time you looked at her you got so much information just from that person just from the way she smoked a cigarette and knowing that that's where you start out and then i was going to have the opportunity to unravel that it became really, really exciting to know that I could go from the actual like height of glamour, yeah. most idealized version of a person to like the harshest, most unforgiving, most torn apart version of that same person, which was really exciting to me. How much uh, can you tell about a character by the way they dance, you think? Because the contrast between, yeah. right? So much. So, I mean, I think that, you know, one of the things that I love about, and because I really do love movies and I love cinema, and one of my favorite things about it is it's a it's a place where you can say so much without words, and um, and then when you have the right words, it just makes the whole thing go to another level. But um, Eileen and Rebecca's connection is we have a dance scene, and you get such a sense of Eileen's nervousness her insecurity her willingness her curiosity her hope and Thompson is she's such a gifted performer but one of her like biggest powers superpowers really is uh, nonverbal communication you just put a camera on her face and it's like symphonies right it, it, books of poetry are just coming I mean it's just amazing I I really 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 marvel at it and um you know in that case my character kind of steps up and realizes that this is a girl who maybe has never been asked to dance and there's something so touching about that and so I I gave her her first dance you know and and there's a tenderness to it and yeah so I think a lot can be communicated through dance uh yeah 
we and we now know in real life, no surprise, Anne Hathaway likes to dance. This might must have sur surprised nobody that this became, or maybe everybody. This is a weird viral thing to happen where you're <laughs> dancing at a fashion show, kind of feeling yourself, enjoying the moment. God bless, enjoy it. And then it mm -hmm. becomes like a viral thing. At this point in your interesting journey through celebrity, is it sort of like, okay, of course, this is now a thing. You know what? There's a lot of different ways to be everywhere. That's a great way to be everywhere. That's true. <laughs> if you're, you're going to get uh, that line. And I, I, I prefer to, I mean, <laughs> and I hope, I yeah, I just, you know, I, I mean, it was just such a fun night. It was, And I was also really happy because Pierre Paolo, um, who's the head designer at Valentino, who took over for my beloved um, friend and family member, Valentino. Um, he, and you know, Pierre Paolo was his accessories director um, for many, many years, um, shared the title. And he, um, he had told me, he was so, he's been so generous with me. And he invited Adam, my husband and I to the show and he invited us a day early. So we come through the atelier and we, could, we met everybody and we got to see the process of putting it together. And, you know, I, I, I love craft work and I love the process. Like I love it in acting and filmmaking. I, I, I love, and, and to, in fashion as well. It's so, you know, I, I get it. For some people, a shirt's a shirt. What's the big deal? But when you actually meet the people who, have this technique of making it and that you find out that they actually hand cut feathers so that way they would be lighter than feathers. I mean, it's so poetic and beautiful. And and, and so anyway, he, he had showed me all of that. He just said, I just want to make a nightclub. I just want to make a nightclub vibe where everybody has a great time. And um, it's such an honor to be asked to one of those shows. It's, you know, it's, it's such an unusual life experience to get to do it. And so um, I guess in that sense, I was happy that, um, when you go viral for dancing, you kind of spread the dance floor out and make the this nightclub bigger than just the physical <laughs> space. And maybe, maybe, maybe we made everybody feel like they were at the club. There you go. You welcomed us all in. Um, exactly. Unwrap the first of many presents this season with holidays on the house from DraftKings Casino with hundreds of games, prizes, and promos. DraftKings Casino has everything on your list right now. New players who play $5 get $100 instantly in casino credits. What are you waiting for? Cozy up with all the classics like slots, blackjack, and roulette. Or play exclusive games you'll find only at DraftKings Casino to feel the holiday cheer all season long. Download the DraftKings Casino app now and sign up with promo code Happy Sad and play $5 to get $100 in casino credits. That's promo code Happy Sad only at DraftKings Casino. The crown is yours. Gambling problem? Call 1 800 Gambler or visit www1800 Gambler.net. In Connecticut, help is available for problem gambling. Call 888 789 77 Seven seven, or visit ccpg.org. Please play responsibly. Twenty one and over. Physically present in Connecticut, Michigan, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, West Virginia only. Void in Ontario. Eligibility and deposit restrictions apply. One per opted in new customer. Five dollars wager required. Maximum one hundred dollars in casino credit awarded, which require one times playthrough within seven days. Terms at casino.draftkings.com slash holidays on the house. Restrictions apply. I'm curious, like, you know, I, I this film probably doesn't get made without you attached to it. And, th and that could probably be said for a number of the recent films uh, that you've done. And that's a great responsibility. That's a privilege. Does it feel like the business is 180 from where you started today, uh, way back when? I mean, does it feel similar? I mean, does it feel like, I don't know, do you feel a responsibility in terms of like getting projects made? Because you're in that that rare group that can get films greenlit at certain budgets. Well, the thing I'm always aware of is that the you have to finish, you're, you're someone who can get a film made for now. <laughs> and right. you kind of have to be aware that... Um, uh, what, what I always try to do is I try to just take the film based on its own merit and figure out what excites me uh, in which I'm not going to betray myself or anything, you know, that I believe in. 
And that can mean making the third princess diaries, right. or it can mean making Eileen, obviously two very different experiences, but um, I'm really, I, I, I have come to really appreciate the shape of my career. Um, I began with like a big, everybody in G rated commercial uh, film that had initial success, but then went on to have this other phenomenal life and kind of, you know, Devil Wears Prada was kind of the same thing where right. it was, you know, a, a nice hit when it came out, but what it, the cultural phenomenon that it turned into has uh, been developing for the past two decades. And those types of films are so important and so dear to me. And I kind of think of them as like my, my more classic offerings. And when I think of something like Eileen, when I think of something like She Came to Me, when I think of something like Colossal, I think yeah. about those as a little bit more of my experiment, my experimental films. And I'm someone who, like I said, I am the first one to a Nancy Myers movie, but I, you know, but my favorite film of the last 10 years was T10. So like, right. I, I and I'm I with you. That, yep. me, that's what it is. I, I'm not an, I'm not an either or I'm a yes and person. Yep. So like, I just think it's not about the genre of the film. It's not about um, the concept of the audience. It's actually about just making something of quality. And if you make something of quality, then that's that's really the beginning and the end. And, and then it's a, and then it's truthful unto itself. I'm curious. I mean, I was looking at the, some of the the early work and the directors you worked with, and not to bring the mood down, but like I, you know, I felt a, a tremendous loss last year. I knew Douglas McGrath a bit, and and we lost him, and he was someone you worked with pretty early on. We've obviously lost Gary in recent years. Jonathan Demi. I mean, these are formative filmmakers. Um, less people know Douglas, but he was such a sweet man. Um, I, I guess just talk to me a little bit about the relationship you had to those those gentlemen and how they informed your choices, the way you approached your craft, anything. Um, yeah. <laughs> They're, um, I'm still processing it. I miss them very much. Yeah. And it's hard. It's hard because um, they're they're my beginning, and I don't get to talk to them in that way. You know, there's so many questions that I have for them now, and um, I love them so much, and I'm really just so grateful to them for uh, seeing something in me. I was a kid. I mean, I was a literal kid when Gary Marshall met me, like a physical, like literal, uh, legal child, and. Um, and he created and allowed me to participate in such a meaningful way in the creation of a character that I'm so closely identified with. And he just set my life up in so many ways, the gift of the gift of, of, of that. And then, um, cause I was never worried about being put into a box because I knew that I just had to be aware if I was aware that there was a box that I could probably make choices that would keep me from getting uh, stuck in it. But you need someone outside the box to see you. And that was Jonathan Demi. Yeah. And I don't know, I literally don't know how he saw through, but he, that was the thing. He was not an either or a person. He was a yes person. And so he thought it was great that I had been this princess. And he didn't see any reason why a princess couldn't also be a recovering addict. And um, and he just had so much faith. He was so generous to me. And Doug McGrath, he, you know, getting to do Nicholas Nickleby, it was my first time going to England. I was just talking about, you know, that time earlier, earlier today, funny enough, when I was getting ready. It was so significant. I got to see the world. I got to do a British accent for the first time. Um, and he and I remained really, really good friends for a long time after that film. I was so, always so happy to see him. He was a total gentleman. But yes, and um, another wonderful filmmaker that I got to work with is no longer with us, who I think of with such fondness and dearness, um, is Gary Winnick. Of course. Well, he, we lost him way too, way too soon. Way too soon. He has yeah. so many more. I mean, they all had so many more stories. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm, you know, it's one of the reasons why I think it's so important, so important to really look at 
what we want to evolve about this industry. And you asked me if it changed and you, you gave the example of a, a 180. And I don't know, I, I don't, I don't understand, I, I don't totally understand the 180 of it, but it has changed a lot. But when I look back at somebody like a Gary Marshall and someone like a Jonathan Demi, they were telling stories about women. They were telling stories that really, 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 and by the way, um, Doug McGrath too, and Gary Winnick. They were all men who absolutely adored women and wanted to tell their help tell their stories. And in the process of telling the stories, they they listened to women and right. they amplified women's voices. And the thing, you know, there there are changes in the business. Some of them are positive. Some of them are sad. And uh, but one of the ones that's positive is that trend seems to be. Um, each one of those men was, was, you know, whenever they had been a filmmaker would have been a really rare find, but the instinct that they had is becoming less and less rare and more and more everywhere. Um, I apologize for, for, for changing the mood so drastically, but it, I mean, it is, it's very sweet to pay tribute to these folks that obviously meant so much to you personally and professionally. Yeah, and I'm okay. Um, you know, I, I just, it's, it's the price of having an open heart. Sometimes you yeah. just burst into tears. <laughs> um, but also I, you know, I was very young when I met them and they are foundational to me. Yeah. It, it's funny when I, you talk a little bit about, you know, knowing, you know, loving that princess Dyer's experience and, 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 and not wanting that to only define you. You wanted that to be an element of your career. And as we've seen in the in the years since, it is just one side of you. And I, and I look at the chronology and it's always easy for folks like me to be like, okay, so this obviously happened here because she was trying to do this, that, or the other. Okay, so, yeah, give me, give me, give me <laughs> no, your take. <laughs> no, it's not, I, I'm not, but I guess I'm preempting it by saying, I know it's not that simple, but <laughs> it is striking to see like uh, just a few years after that, there is that kind of one-two punch of havoc and, um, broke back. And yeah. I'm, I'm curious, like, how tough was it to get into those films at the time? Was Ang Lee like, I don't want Princess Diaries girl in my, in my prestige movie. And how, and, and I guess how did team Hathaway at the time uh, feel about the kind of choices you wanted to make in that early career when you could have gone down the Ella enchanted Princess Diaries path for another five, 10 years if you so desired, presumably. Well, I think it's important to mention that uh, Team Hathaway then is still Team Hathaway. That speaks volumes. Look, I there was I, when I was starting out my with my career, um, I met with a lot of different people, and I was very upfront with them about the. They were very clear about a path that they saw for me, and it was you know the sweetheart path, right? And that is a fantastic path, and it's beautiful, and those roles and that persona and all of that is really, I marvel at people who are that. Um, but I know myself and I know that, you know, such as it is, I do have an edge. I knew I wouldn't be happy unless I could explore complicated, dark things. And I was just really upfront about that. I said, listen, I get it. I, you guys are discussing me. Like I have this huge brand opportunity. Um, and maybe that'll happen but it won't be worth anything unless I'm an artist. And I didn't go to drama school, so I'm gonna have to learn on set. I'm gonna have to learn on, I'm gonna have to learn- I Pay people. my dues and yeah. Mm -hmm. And pay my dues. And I kind of said to them, and I think the way I do that is by working with the greatest directors I can that will have me. And I don't care how small the part is. Um, I just wanna go be around them and absorb. And so, that meant different things at different times. But I remember, I mean, Brokeback Mountain, it's just, oh, that script was so, I don't know. I'm actually not even gonna attempt to put it into words. It was just one of the greatest, if not the greatest things I'd ever read, Diana Osana, Larry McMurtry. And my, and I read it and they said, you know, they, they said, which part did you respond to? I said, Lorene. They said, really, it's the smaller part. I said, no, I'm Lorene. By the way, I am kind of dressed like her today. <laughs> <laughs> Still in character all these years later. Um, and I owe, I really think I owe that job, yeah, to 
to, to certain other things, but I really owe it to A.D. Kaufman, uh, the, the casting director, because the way she positioned it to Ang Lee, she left the Princess Diaries out of it. And she said she's a theater actress from New York. There you go. And which was true. Um, and she and she said, but she's out here doing a movie. She's going to ha- she has to come on her lunch break. I did my audition on, on my lunch break from Princess Diaries 2. And we were shooting the coronation scene. So I had like the full thing. So I took the tiara off, took the ball gown off, put my flannel shirt on <laughs> and I, and I went and I auditioned with Aang and we just had this stunning connection. Yeah. Really, really stunning connection. And I've come, I, I like at the time it felt really special, but you know, I'm, I've been alive for many years since that audition and I've come to realize how magical a connection just right off the bat it was. And um, I auditioned for him and, I felt I felt that thing that you always hope for as an actor when you just feel like you're flying and you don't even feel the words and and you're just kind of you go to another place. And I kind of blacked out in the audition and um, while also being like totally present. And uh, I remember as I was leaving, Ang said, can you ride a horse? And I said, absolutely. Because it wasn't true, but I knew that I could make it through. <laughs> <laughs> Give me two weeks. I got this. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. And uh, I and and I uh, and I left the room, and I thought to myself, I think I just shut the door behind me. Like I think I like that's that feeling you get sometimes when you audition. You're like, I believe I just shut the door behind me, and I I don't think anybody else is going in. Wow. And that's how I felt about that one, and I and I I got it, and. It was funny because um, there was another film that wound up being very significant and I needed uh, to show proof of my work to be considered for the for the part because I'm very known as being a princess and Brokeback hadn't come out yet and I was so generous and he screened the, the phone call scene that I had with Heath Ledger and this person then said, oh, she's got it, okay, um, we're good. And that was a film that went on to be very significant in my life and career. funny i also think of that uh, you know in an actor's life sometimes it's the movies that they, that don't get made that set you on a different path because I, I could imagine an alternate reality where i don't think we've ever discussed this there was that famous spider-man movie that sounded like very close to happening you were in it i think this is sam raimi yeah. he was doing a fourth one it was you john malkovich i don't mm-hmm. know if angelina jolie was officially on or not um, and it was sounded pretty far down that path. And I wonder if that movie gets made, if Dark Knight Rises and Catwoman happen for you. That's how I hold it. The way I hold it is if that movie had gotten made, I don't know if I would have been uh, considered because I, I don't know if he would have said, no, no, she's, she's, she's occupied in another universe. Um, and so that's why as an actor, you don't know this on day one, but you you learn to just go that, you know what? the right role finds the right person. And sometimes it's you and sometimes it's not. And so when it doesn't happen, just trust deeper and keep going, just keep going. Like there was, um, I was talking about, I can't say which one, but uh, there was a musical that I was supposed to do and um, that got cast, went through the whole audition process and it got preempted for Princess Diaries too. Like I, I I couldn't make it. And I was, I mean, I was so young and so immature and so, devastated right and um but then looking back if i'd gotten it i don't know that lame would have been lame because there was a surprise factor to all of us singing in that movie and uh and the element of surprise would have been given away and so you just kind of go you just gotta it sounds maybe a little corny uh but you really do have to keep it grateful like yeah. like like it, funny enough, a career has something to do with you, but it also doesn't have a lot to do with you. Right. You know, so you just kind of got to lean in, lean into it, lean into what's happening and, and, and go with it and learn. And sometimes like you receive praise and sometimes you get knocked down and, you know, it all kind of, but it's your life and it's what you signed up for because you, you, you felt this thing inside of yourself that said, this is what you're supposed to do. It's not a, a usual thing to do. No. <laughs> it's not no. fun. <laughs> But, but when you're, but when you feel it, when it's what you want, you literally can't imagine anyone ever doing it. You don't, you can't even imagine a life that doesn't involve it. 
can I can I just ask a nerdy follow up on the Spider Man front? Like, did you read yeah. a script? Like, how did you get into costume? Like, how close did that come? Uh, did not get into costume and did not read a script past the audition sites. Got it. But again, at the time, probably exciting. I, but I, I got the part, and uh, yeah, and it just. Uh, I think that that's probably more the producer's story to tell than mine. Right. You know what I mean? If, if should they ever decide to tell it, because the Spider-Man universe has gone on to be so enormous and so thrilling. Yeah. Like, 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 and, and, con and like, it's just reinventing itself and all of those things. So I wouldn't want to make more of it than, than is necessary. Do, do you have a similar philosophy? I would think you do. Like, I mean, Barbie came in and went this year and was a phenomenon. And there was a moment where you were attached to a different iteration, as I understand it, to Barbie. Yeah. Um, when you say the philosophy, you mean of, of of letting go of whatever, not even like anger or resentment, because that that would be silly, silly, but just sort of like, oh, that would have been cool if that had worked out, and I see how it resonated with people. But again, that's that was even a different project, I guess, when you were doing it. I think the thing you have to imagine is, and the thing that's so exciting about what Margot and Greta and Ryan and that entire and America and that entire phenomenal yep. team, they hit a bullseye. And the bullseye caused the entire world to like, like reach this level of ecstasy. Right. Now imagine that version, that much energy, that much anticipation, that much emotion, but it's not the right version. Right. So I actually think of it as a lucky thing. And I, as I mentioned, I think that like, I think that Margot is just sublime. Yeah. period full stop and i think that what she is doing as a creative person and as a producer is so exciting and inspiring and what and and the um the the mythic giants that they toppled with that film that have kept certain narratives in place that have not allowed opportunities to develop for so many people they just they ran straight through them dancing sparkling <laughs> and um, I'm not just saying this, just as a cinema goer, just as a woman in Hollywood since I was a kid, I'm thrilled, I'm thrilled by the development. Yeah. And if I believed that the version that I was attached to could have done that, yeah, I might feel differently about it, but I genuinely think theirs was the best possible version. And so it's actually very easy to just be thrilled yeah. and happy and like just watching, because I'm also a person who I love watching women kill it i just do i just yeah. love it i just love it it's and and also to to do so well so undeniably that they actually had to like write new records right Come that's on. the word undeniable no one could be like uh, i don't get it no like this was this was so <laughs> undeniable so completely undeniable yeah. and i think it's probably going to make things better um i want to mention a few upcoming things um for you because you've got a busy slate that i'm very excited about you mentioned you know wanting to see other great actors actresses succeed i'm very excited to see what sounds like a two-hander you and jessica chastain front and center that's yeah. that gets my ticket immediately oh, um God, we love each other so much <laughs> <laughs> what can you say uh about uh it's called uh mother's instinct right yes i will say that um about that one i don't want to say too much but i will say that um that to me is a film about um, what can happen when you don't have an identity outside of the one society says you should have. Okay. T dot, dot, dot. Here we go. Uh, coming <laughs> soon. Um, you probably can't say much more about this, but I am excited that you're working with, not only with David Lowry, but with David Lowry on a musical? Like full-on musical? Okay. <laughs> it's been a minute, though. It's been a long minute since you have done a full-on musical. So I would think after Les Mis, it's like, I'm not going to follow that up with a C-grade musical. You're going to wait for the right one. C-grade musical, Josh. Well, there are no, there's no such thing as a C-grade musical. No, 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 All no, musicals no, no, no. are perfect. Um, <laughs> no, but... but well, I, um, no, I, listen, I love the idea of... I love the idea of making literally anything, but the right one. Right. You know? And so in this, in this case... Um, I think the only thing you need to know is that it's a David Lowry film. And um, to the extent that it interests you, I'm in it. And 
so thrilling, and everybody should be thrilled by this, Michaela Cole is fireworks at it. No and, awesome. Um, okay. but I, I, I also think that, I also think that um, it's funny. It's we're in this really funny time about film where uh, an information and that, that thing, like for example, with Eileen, I believe going into Eileen totally cold is the way to see it. I think yeah. not knowing, and, and, and when I talk about my trust in audiences and my trust in audience participation, that comes from my, that comes from the influence that Jonathan Demi has had on me uh, as an audience member which is, I do not think it's my job to argue with a filmmaker. I don't think that it's, my, as an audience member, I don't think that it's my job to question it in a way like, mm, could it have been different or could it have been My only job as an audience is to show up, participate. And whenever I ask why, I ask why in a way that benefits the director's vision, not criticizes it, you know right. what I mean? And so David is an auteur and I think it's going to be a full on experience. And there is music. Um, and the other project that is coming pretty soon. Uh, yes, I think. <laughs> you think, <laughs> unless they change it in the edit a lot. <laughs> yeah. By the way, like I, I, yes, it's a David Lowry film. It's whatever he wants it to be. Yeah. No, I love. I mean, what he does with genre and your expectations always is very interesting. So I'm, I'm in again. Um, the idea of you, I think, has a very, has a lot of fans very excited. This is based on a book. I'm not. I, I, I myself. Have not read it. You seem obviously very excited about this. Um, so, have you have you a uh, red, white, and royal blue has put Nicholas on the map? Yes. So, so, chemistry there, that relationship being depicted on screen. What can fans expect? Well, it's funny when you asked me about how important dance is. Um, it actually was so in, uh, integral to how Nick got cast in the idea of you because, um, you know. Y y we met with so many wonderful actors. And the question was like, okay, how do you, how do you do a chemistry read? And um, the, you know, the idea of making out with all of the characters, <laughs> oh, sorry, all the actors that were coming and didn't really appeal to me. And so I was like, you know, how do you decide whether or not you have chemistry with someone like you dance with them? So, oh my God. Um, so part of the audition was, yes, you have to prepare the scenes, but there sure. was, and we came up with the idea um, of doing an improv where it's like, you're going to bring in a song of your own choosing that Hayes would love, and you're going to convince Solan, my character, to dance. And when you just signal to Michael Showalter, our director, he's gonna press play, and I don't know what's about to happen. And we'll see what happens when we dance. And we just explored it together and it was really interesting to discover that because there were certain people that they aced the readings, but they, we had no chemistry when we were dancing. And I, I mentioned before, like the yes and of it all. Nick and I are very yes and together. Right. Just kind of builds. We it just um, it was so much fun. We had so 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 much fun working on this. And um, he's he's he, he's easy to he's somebody who's very easy to kind of like spark with. Right. Like just who he is as a person, so which is exactly what you want from Hazen Solan. So what was so the song know. he you chose? Know, um, I will leave it up to him to tell you. Not because <laughs> I don't remember, which I 100% don't, but because it's his story to tell. <laughs> <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. Let's end with the happy, sad, confused, profoundly random question air. Uh, what do you collect? Do you collect anything? Abalone. Wait, ab what? Abalone? <laughs> what? What's the connection? The connection problems. What is abalone? I collected, and I actually don't know if I'm pronouncing it correctly. It's um, it's either abalone or abalone, but it's it's a type of shell, and um, a lot of people make really beautiful ob objects or objets from it. But my uh, my grandmother um, had uh, before until she quit. She was a smoker, and she used to use them as ashtrays. And I kind of ignored the ash and I just thought they were so beautiful. They're very iridescent on the bottom, a bit like my nails right now. Got it. And um, I just think that they're, it's like one of the more beautiful things on God's green earth. And so, yeah, I collect. Love it. Like that, that is our first abalone um, uh, answer. Oh, what? What's the most, <laughs> what's the most uh, like the most common answer? 
it, it really runs the gamut. Uh, could be like if they're movie posters, could be good guitars. Someone answered Tom Blythe, the new lead, actually in the Hunger Games movie, actually just said, um, uh, rocks, stones. So maybe you guys could could bond on that. You know, I'll be in a corner. <laughs> <laughs> Don't leave Tom and Annie yeah. alone with their rocks. I'll be yeah. Like, oh yes, Tom Shale. I mean, it's just <laughs> check this one out. Um, <laughs> what's the wallpaper on your phone? Um, oh, I'm so embarrassed because I don't know the name of the artist, but it's called uh, Portrait of an Old... Do I have my phone? No, I don't. But it's an, it's called Portrait of an Old Woman, and it's a picture of... It's a vintage portrait of a woman, and they kind of did a collage of all of these flowers around it. And um, Amy Williams, who's the production designer on The Idea of You and I became... She was actually the production designer on uh, We Crashed. And I had recommended her to Michael Showalter and they met and they fell in love. And she did the most phenomenal job on the idea of you. And um, we spent a lot of time, my character is an art dealer and we spent a lot of time looking at art together. And I put uh, I put it on my phone uh, after we worked together because the film deals a lot with the concept of age. Right. And, um, and so the idea that I was staring at this picture, uh, this photograph of a woman who at some point in time would be old, but at the time of the picture was young, but then the photograph aged and was made even more beautiful by the hand of an artist. And so the fact that it was called Portrait of an Old Woman, I thought was very cool. Nice. Okay, let's end with this. Worst note a director has ever given you. You don't have to name names, but what, what note sticks in your brain forever? Like First take. What are you doing? First take, first day. And that's, 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 that's the tone right there. Yeah. Literally did not recover for the entire performance. <laughs> it's such a, it's such a nervous performance. It's so stiff and it's uh, not one that I, not. it's one that I, it's as soon as you're done, you're just like, now let me do the whole thing over now, please, please. But, um, but yeah, it, it was not a, it was not a, not the feeling. <laughs> Not the positive pretty, atmosphere you need or want as an actor. I, uh, I was pretty. Yeah. I was pretty tearful for the rest of that job. No. <laughs> now, 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 I think I'd handle it. Now I'd handle it. But at the time, I. At the time, you know, when you when you, when you're just starting out, you have so many insecurities. And That's not on I, you. You shouldn't have to handle a note like that. No, no actor should have to hear that. I mean, it's supposed to be. No, a, it's not. It's not. Look, it's not a gracious note. No. But I also, I would know how to handle it while saving my performance. While, while, right. You know what I mean? Like I, I would, I would know how not to fall apart because of that. Because the thing that you have to know as an actor is what literally whatever's going mm -hmm. on, it can't touch the screen. Right. Like you have to, you owe it to your character you to, to, to fight through everything because sh your character is going to exist forever. Right. And, and so, uh, and I, I've just learned that lesson many, many times that you just can't give into whatever momentary distraction is happening. You have to kind of tap into and, and, and search for that place where you kind of, like I mentioned before, where you kind of black out. Yeah. There's no better feeling than, you guys at the end of performance, you're like, I actually have no idea what just happened. <laughs> right. You went to some other, yeah, other space. Yeah. That's, That's magic. Yeah. When that when that when that happens, you're just like, whatever it is. I hope I like it, but I I know that the the offering feels very very pure. Um. Well, we ran the gamut today. We laughed. We cried. Apparently, we did. We did. <laughs> um, did you feel confused at any point? Do you have any point where I was talking and you were like? What? The abalone, just the abalone uh, <laughs> threw me. Okay. Other than that, we were on the same page. He um, furiously Googles. What's your wallpaper on your phone, by the way? Oh, it's my my dog's, my dog right behind me. Lucy. It's good old Lucy. Is that pink shirt? Yeah, it says the goodest, obviously. Oh, I was wondering if maybe you had taken her to the opening weekend of Barbie. <laughs> <laughs> well, she did dress up as um Weird Barbie for Halloween. Perfect. Yeah. Perfect, uh, perfect. We're selling tickets to Eileen and Barbie now on uh, video on demand, apparently, <laughs> today. <laughs> um, congratulations, <Sorry>. Annie. It's <laughs> been far too long. Um, everybody should check out Eileen. Um, this woman can do it all, um, whether Great. it is a rom-com, a Princess Diaries, a superhero movie, or the funky cool shit like Eileen and Colossal. She We're can trying. do it. We're trying. You're succeeding. Um, thank you, as thank always, you. for the time. Thank you, Josh.
See you soon. All right. Have a good one. (laughs) And so ends another edition of Happy, Sad, Confused. Remember to review, rate, and subscribe to this show on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. I'm a big podcast person. I'm Daisy Ridley, and I definitely wasn't pressured to do this by Josh. (laughs) Ha ha ha!